Good afternoon, everybody. Next week we have Kate Isaac from UC Davis. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Saul from Capalcom. I do not know if a prerequisite of watching his talk is knowledge of Kung Fu. <laughs> but he's going to tell us about Enter the Dragon, so let's welcome our guest. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so, yep, I am Dr. Corey Sewell. Uh, still work for me to say that. I uh, finished my PhD maybe four, four and a half years ago. So, Corey, Dr. Corey, Mr. Corey, if you're uh, one of my son's friends, whatever, work, work for you. Um, don't know Kung Fu. Um, I wish I had learned it. Um, I do watch Kung Fu Panda with my son a lot. Um, other than that, though, the name of the talk, Enter the Dragon, a peek inside of uh, Qualcomm's Snapdragon memory controller team. All right, so to get started with that, just quick profile. That's me. Um, academics, I went to University of California, Riverside, uh, four years. I got my degree in computer science. Then went to Michigan um, for master's and PhD. Uh, thesis was scalable. High performance interconnect architectures to many, for many core systems. Um, I don't know why thesis names always have to be something crazy long, but you have to do that to make it sound cool. Um, what am I? What I do now? I'm a SLC performance architect for Qualcomm uh, memory controller team. SLC meaning system on a chip. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, what are my outside interests? Well, first and foremost, husband. So my wife's right here, uh, and father of two. So this is us. Uh, that was last Halloween. We were, we were Power Rangers, so that was fun. I'm not sure if Power Rangers is anything people know about anymore, but that was fun for me at least. Um, teaching. Uh, when I was in school, I did a lot of kind of a C++ workshops and, you know, and things like that just to kind of make some money on the side while I was a student. But that's kind of grown on me as well. So I have an engineering camp for third through sixth graders that I run in San Diego. Sports, basketballaholic, fan, weekend warrior, youth coach. Um, put, I put an asterisk there because I was a weekend warrior until I hurt my knee. So now I just kind of uh, act like I'm a weekend warrior. And um, football fanatic. Love seafood, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's a little bit of uh, my background, kind of things I like um, outside of work. But getting into, getting into today, uh, we'll do a quick introduction. That was just what you saw. Um, so quick video on Snapdragon, just so we're all on the same page of what we're talking about. Um, a little Qualcomm 101, what are the products, what's the system on a chip, um, what does that architecture look like? And then uh, finally, we'll get into the memory controller team, just a general overview, some of the challenges of that team. And then if we have time, we'll talk about um, a little bit of things that are innovative for future architectures, kind of just kind of postulating on, on future questions there. So at my peril, anytime you try to show a video in, in a class like this, you always are hoping that it'll turn out good for you, but we'll see. Uh, let's see. So this ran, maybe some lights. Do you have some lights over there? Uh, not good enough. Okay, so this is a video I think ran in 2013 on a Snapdragon. Let's see if you can. This summer, yeah. a dragon is coming. The Lord I wish I had made that video myself, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> but it's a cool video, and it's kind of illustrative of at least um, the marketing spill of what uh, Qualcomm wants to say and what wants to kind of show to uh, to our customers, being Samsung, Huawei, whoever want to buy a chip, even Apple. 
and then how hopefully that plays out into, into future products. So that makes the engineers have to kind of prove that the marketing is right. So, so Qualcomm 101, going further into that, I guess the easiest way to say this slide is it's a big company, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a non-trivial company. Um, the big thing about Qualcomm is we're big on wireless technology, right? So modem, LTE, 3G, LTE, all that good stuff. Um, and also, it's a fabulous semiconductor company, right? So we'll, we make the chip, but we'll send it off to the lab, um, to, to the foundry to get, to get uh, built for us. Um, global foundries, um, you name it. Um, so we have all these great accolades. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, product areas, right? So we are mobile first and foremost. So smartphones was the big was the big push for the past, what, three, three to five years at least. Um, but also just regular computing as well. Regular computing. Um, so laptops, tablets, stuff like that. Consumer electronics, um, <laughs> Kindles, et cetera, et cetera. Internet, Internet of everything, networking, right? So all, those, are, those are the range of products um, that Qualcomm's interested in and has these different kind of um, big kind of marketing names that they want to push upon customers to use, right? Um, Gobi, Snapdragon, Ethereum. So um, what is a Snapdragon? So that's probably the key thing here. It's a system on a chip. It's a kind of our preeminent system on a chip solution for mobile architectures. What does that mean? So we do smartphones. So most of the stuff that, that you see on the bottom there, right? So Galaxy phones, we were in all of those, HTC, et cetera. Um, tablets, so um, Fire, some Kindle stuff, um, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe people don't know this, some set-top boxes, gaming, cameras, wearable, um, any type of thing that's going to be mobile technology, Qualcomm has its hand in or is trying to push into, right? So lots, lots of cool products, um, lots of things that um, are going forward for the future. Um, what does it mean to have a mobile SLC or a mobile system on a chip? So even digging a little deeper into that. Um, so a system on a chip is a collection of processing cores um, inter integrated together um, on one processor or one chip, right? And so that SLC is going to provide the essential functionality um, for, for your whole platform, being that a phone or a tablet or, or that kind of mobile device, right? So if you look into that a little bit deeper, right, you, you imagine all these different things that, that go on in your smartphone. So, of course, I think, I think that's a picture of a Galaxy S4. And, but in, in your smartphone, you have all, all these great components, right? You have modem, meaning you have your 4G LTE stuff, you have a Wi-Fi, you have your Bluetooth. Um, most people take cameras and selfies <laughs> with their phone, right? Uh, display, CPU, whatever sensors that you want to do, um, with your fingerprint or whatever sensors, um, graphics, audio, and of course, um, everybody has to talk to memory at some point, right? So all of these things are different processing <laughs> cores on a particular chip, right? And if you put them all on one chip, that's, that makes it a system on a chip. And that's what Qualcomm specializes in because we can, we can provide all of that to you together and integrate it. You don't have to go to the vendor A for the modem and vendor B for the CPU and vendor C for this or that, right? The, the key here is that we, we get the integration and we have different teams that are specialized there and we can put them together quickly for you. All right, let's dig even deeper, right? So that's the high level view. This is the big view, right? Um, so if, if we're gonna look inside of a system on a chip, um, actually, yep, yeah, if you're gonna look inside of a system on a chip, right? So all those components that I kind of showed in a nice uh, PowerPoint block diagram -y way, um, this is probably your, your, your Visio way um, of seeing it, is that, so I think you saw like a graphics and, and display blocks on the previous slide, that's gonna go in here, right? So you're gonna have these different blocks, they're gonna go on an interconnect, you know, interconnects and eventually make it back to memory, right? Same thing for your CPU, same thing for your sensors, and um, same thing for your peripherals, right? So all of these um, are different blocks in a, in a hardware architecture. All of them have specialized teams and experts in those areas. <laughs> and the key thing, of course, is that they're, inter they're inter interconnected together. Um, what makes it cool is this, it's, a, it's a system on a chip platform, right? So within the block, depending on your, on your level, where, whether you're a low tier phone um, or high tier phone, we can give you more or less, right? So for instance, the example is, um, if you're if you're in the CPU block, right? Um, if the, if you have a Qualcomm, I don't know, thousand ten CPU, um, we might give you eight cores of processing power, right? If you have a very low tier phone, we might give you two cores of processing power, right? So we have to build this platform so it's flexible, so, so that you can reuse it over and over again, um, and, and to build to different product lines. Um, that's that's what kind of makes us have a quick time to market and have a, a, a easier way to. Um, to build custom chips, right? So, so you, you build the one architecture there. Um, what we're going to focus on today a little bit is the memory controller, right? So all of these different cores 
eventually need to need to buy for main memory access, right? So what the memory controller needs to do here is efficiently arbitrate those accesses, right? So um, if display has something urgent and uh, GPU is doing some, doing something at the same time, we have to figure out who, who has priority and what bandwidth to give to give each client. Um, same thing for modem. If, if, if you're on a phone call, right, um, you probably don't care as much as your um, you probably don't care as much for your display to be running r running at a high speed, right? So we need to prioritize that your phone call runs and doesn't drop the call or has any static on there, right? So in the memory controller, that plays out in terms of we need to make sure that they get bandwidth and the priority of bandwidth. So that's a, that's a big thing there. So um, it's really cool to be in the memory controller team because even though all the other, all the other blocks look kind of big and kind of daunting and so on and so forth, um, it all comes home to the memory controller, right? And we all and, and being on that team, um, it's really cool because I get to kind of sponge off of everybody else's knowledge, right? So if something's not working, say, hey, you know, um, I'm not getting enough bandwidth. And I say, why? Well, you don't have to tell me your problem. I'm going to have to learn from what you're doing, and then we'll figure it out. So I get to kind of sponge off of GPU, CPU guys, everybody in my one little, little memory controller job, right? Um, so, okay, that's the, that's the high-level overview of Qualcomm SOCs. What's, what's the um, hardware architecture? How does that play out? Um, in the particular team... Kind of what, it's kind of what I said earlier in terms of everybody's kind of coming into the memory controller and vying for main memory or DRAM access, right? Um, the thing about it is there's kind of three kind of performance points. Um, you know, the classic architecture thing, right? There's area, right, that drives your, your, for, your, your cost and your form factor um, of your device, right? If you do a bigger chip, then your, the actual phone that you have, the actual tablet you have, um, going to be more, more area, of course. Um, you, and people, well... At one point, everybody wanted very small phones, and I think now we're reversing and getting to phablets, and you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing, but um, the, the, the area is always going to be a cheap concern, right, because you have to make a wafer, you have to cut it up, you have to get a certain yield, so that's, so that's going to be um, a cheap concern power, right? Um, you want long battery life, right? You want to be able to go to your, your concert and wherever and have your phone work that whole time. Um, so, so the memory controller must operate efficiently there. Um, also... In terms of power, thermal power, um, you don't want to get hot and burn up your pocket, right? That's that's not very fun either. Um, performance, um, you want um, neg negligible response time when it, whenever you're using your phone or whatever you're using your, your mobile device, right? Um, I think the, the good example there is if you touch your screen or if you do anything with the display, maybe zoom out. Um, that's a high priority task, right? So if that happens, the memory controller need, needs to say, let's make sure that the display gets that gets that priority fast enough so that the user do doesn't notice that there's time being, being taken here, right? Um, if you do see hiccups in that, um, you're going to complain and not want to buy the phone, right? So, that's, so th those type of things are what we have to manage. Um, the target areas for the team, there's obviously the interconnect, right? Um, CPU might have a really fast connection to the memory um, versus a peripheral, mm -hmm. maybe USB, maybe, um, maybe audio. May maybe they have a slower interconnect to the, to the memory. So th those are always trade-offs there w within the controller. Um, we have the microarchitecture spec, how many registers, how many caches, how many, you know, the, the classic, classic logic design view, model development, um, platform performance analysis, which is what we'll get into today, design and synthesis, power modeling, post silicon support, goes on and on, right? But those are the main focus areas for our team. Um, and today, we'll talk more, mainly about model development and uh, platform performance analysis. That's kind of my key areas. Um, I have one slide on power because I can't get away. We're talking about chip design without at least saying, you know, make sure you, you, you recognize that's, that's a key constraint. Um, that's, a, that's a whole other thing. And Dr. Bavar knows all about that, right? So let's talk about modeling. So the goal here, we need to set up an environment that's going to project the future performance of a chip, right? We plan these chips two, three, five years out later, right? It's not built yet. We have to build a model to say, is this going to be a good idea or a bad idea? Um, but within that, there's all these various levels of accuracy and speed going on here, right? Um, so at the kind of top level of um, speed is actually having the model, right? So you actually have an RT, you actually have a chip, you can just run it. Um, but um, at the other end of it, um, I'm sorry, at, 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 at the top level of accuracy is, 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 your, R, is, is your RTL model. That, that's, that actually gets um, synthesized down into your chip. Versus the top level of speed is having um, a theoretical model. I think we kind of joke about it as being like an Excel spreadsheet model type of thing, where you're just making calculations and you can kind of figure out a high level of what you want to do on your particular chip. 
Then you kind of go down a little bit, and you can have your high level architecture. Um, you can have your high level exploration, meaning you have a component of interest, say CPU, and then you're going to have some um, various theories or, or, or uh, various kind of assumptions on what the rest of the of, of the uh, model is doing, right? So that's very high level exploration where you have one detail component, and the rest you're, you're saying, hey, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to just assume it takes 100 cycles to memory. We're going to just assume that the graphics is perfect here, and so we're going to concentrate on our particular component of interest. And then kind of in between that a little bit, um, you have your system level modeling, meaning every particular component needs to have some type of, um, I want to say cycle approximate type, type of core, right? So CPU needs to have its kind of ARM A57 model, GPU has to have its Adreno model, um, modem has to have its LTE model. We put it all together and we get system level issues there. The key here is that we have, we have to have good use case coverage. So marketing has to define what are the key use cases for a phone? Is it 4K display? Um, is it a certain level of phone call at, um, accuracy? Um, and then based off of that, we'll do the exploration. Then we'll do some correlation here. Correlation meaning that the system level model has some kind of, um, has, some kind of has enough accuracy with the RTL model, right? So, um, and if, if, if we can do that, then if, if we have problems on the chip after it comes back, then we're able to replay it in the system level model. Um, I probably didn't put uh, one of the big things about about these models is it's probably uh, visibility too, right? So your system level model, you have a uh, you have a lot more visibility than you have on your RTL model versus if you have on your chip. So it's very important for the system level model to correlate, so that if you have a problem, you can go replay it, have the visibility. Um, by by, visi by by visibility, I mean if you're doing a C plus C plus plus model, <coughs> I can add whatever variables I want to kind of see something. If I'm on a chip, it's already made. All I have is the signals and performance counters. So I have to kind of do a higher level assumption there. So um, th those are really important. Expertise is needed up and down the spectrum. We have people all over the place for that. Um, if you can do a very good job in your modeling environment, um, then your time to market is that much faster. Your ideas, your, your ideas get um, panned out that much faster as well. So that's kind of a very important aspect. And that's kind of what my sub team works on at Qualcomm. Um, Next thing, of course, is once you have the model, you have to kind of analyze what you're getting back from the model. Uh, so you want to analyze the platform. By platform, it's kind of like that big level block that I showed earlier. Um, and you're saying all the system components into one environment, you, you typically call your platform. And so each kind of client is evaluated for, at least on the, the memory controller size, side, you have, we have to know the total bandwidth, we have to know the efficiency, um, latency, quality of service, um, and different client-specific metrics. CPU cares about critical word first, read latency a lot of the time. Um, GPU cares about just total bandwidth a lot of the time. Modem mm -hmm. has kind of a, a hybrid scheme. Um, for video or display, you have different buffers you have to keep at a certain level of, of fullness, so to speak. So each of, the, each of these clients have specific uh, KPIs or key performance indicators that we have to kind of manage there. But within that, we concentrate on, um, it, it always comes down to what efficiency we're running at, and how much total bandwidth that we can give them um, with a certain quality of service. So for this talk, um, I'm going to concentrate on total bandwidth and efficiency. Um, but I don't want that to get away from there's other things that are also important in performance analysis as well. Um, Okie dokie. So total bandwidth. Um, this is always a fun one. This is always kind of what you start with. When, so when, when I'm building a chip, I need to figure out, for a given use case, does my memory system or my memory controller, can I get enough bandwidth for, to even support that use case? If I don't have enough bandwidth for it, then we should just, you know, that's a showstopper. We need to figure out how do we fit, um, how do we fit the use case in the, in the kind of chip technology that we have in the first place. Um, so total, total memory bandwidth, just to be specific, um, whatever your memory width is, so your memory width could be four bytes, could be eight bytes, 16 bytes, maybe, um, whatever data rate you're running at, um, times the frequency, and then times the number of channels that you have. So it's a little, little specific there. But um, just in the grand scheme of things, is this, this is kind of an example of a stack that you would look at. Um, if, if you're on the job, and if you're at the high level of a saying, is this a marketing use case that we should pursue? Um, and maybe, 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 well, I always get in trouble because I always try to get real use cases, and people always say, you can't show that. And I say, fine. So I always get, have to give general examples. So sorry about that. But just, just think that, that we're doing an example of a concurrent system, let's say we're doing a 4K video, let's say it also has, it also has um, to support some bandwidth, that, some bandwidth from modem, and um, CPU is doing some things as well. So first thing is you're kind of bandwidth stacking, you're saying CPU has, has enough, CPU and GPU has so much, and you're going all across 
and stacking how much bandwidth I need for, from each component. That's important because if you go over a certain level, we need to know who to pull back from, right, or who to give more. Um, and then you're saying for a given memory architecture, so it's, for mobile, we do LPDDR. Um, if you're talking about desktop or server, you might do PC DDR. But for mobile, we're saying uh, LPDDR Y technology can run at 1,000 megahertz, and I can give it one channel, right? So if, if I do that, then I will get a certain bandwidth, and I can handle the full use case. If I do the one with LPDDR X at 800 megahertz with two channels, um, I can't support um, the, the, the full use case, so I'm going to have to either get rid of, um, what am I saying? I'm going to get, I'm gonna have to get rid of video and audio, or I'm going to have to readjust my use case appropri appropriately, right? So that total bandwidth is always the first level of can I even support this or not for technology. So what you want to look at, though, is um, if you can't support it, then what do you do, right? You can always increase the memory frequency um, at the cost of power, right? So at some point, you can't just say, let's run it faster, but um, that's always the first thing. How about just like, well, actually, like the CPU guys or, or people that don't run the memory system always say, just clock it faster. And we say, well, if you're wanting to burn up your pocket, then we can do that. Um, or you can just, uh, you can increase the number of memory channels. Um, won't go into too much depth on, on a channel and things like that right now, but also channels mean more area, also means more power as well. Um, and then, of course, you can update your memory component. Um, can you go to a different technology node? Um, are there different um, are there different te technology improvements that you can just literally get and kind of um, subsume that performance there, right? So that, that's always the first level question. Um, next, you're saying efficiency, right? So total bandwidth assumes that you're getting ideal efficiency for your memory controller, for your memory. But um, they go hand in hand, right? So your chief bandwidth is your efficiency times your total bandwidth, right? Um, so example, if you're running LPDDR Y at, at uh, 1,000 megahertz, and if that can only be run at 50% efficiency, it, can, it may not solve all use cases, right? So that's the next level of what are we really running at? How, how good is our architecture to even handle um, the full bandwidth there? So the example would be this, right? Um, we have an example, and we said, hey, you know, we can use LPDDR Y, it'll work <coughs> great. We can solve this challenge. And then we run it on our architecture, and then we say, uh-oh, we're only getting 50% efficiency out of there, right? So that's where, that's where the, the performance analysis comes in and saying, why or how do we get that efficiency up? Um, so if we're doing that, um, we have to figure out how, to, how does the memory controller maximize that efficiency? Um, how, do we, how do we be smarter or, or maybe even simplify things so that, we can, so that we can up this efficiency as much as possible to support whatever use case that we want to support there. So there is, what, there's probably semesters and years worth of research and work and, and learning to do that. One, one of the fun parts for me about um, Qualcomm is I actually came there with uh, zero memory controller experience, right? I came there, finished my PhD, um, had a lot of experience in CPUs, um, did a lot of modeling, just architecture, right? Um, fun stuff, right? And they said, hey, this would be a, this would be a cool area. This would be fun. Um, so that, that first, you know, two, three months was all fun and learning about memory controller. But you can do that um, if, if you have strong fundamentals. And there is a lot of work once, once you look into the box, and you peer open to the box about um, how to improve that efficiency. And ironically, or maybe not, not so ironically, that abstractly um, pertains to all the areas of architecture. I think my old professor, um, Trevor Mudge, used to say, um, all architecture is what? Um, you, you either can cache something, you can either increase the frequency, or you can do some speculation, right? So that typically runs tr rings true. Maybe less speculation because you're in the memory and you can't just write things <laughs> that, that you want, but it rings true there, and so um, that really helped me out in the memory controller group. So, so Okay, so going forward, though, we have total bandwidth and we have efficiency, and you have to get a certain efficiency to get, that, um, to get a certain bandwidth, right? So, that, so that's, that's the key thing there. Um, Next up is what does it what does it mean to have good efficiency? So I'm not sure how familiar we are with DRM architecture, so you know I have to go really really high level here. Um, let's just assume that we have one bank, right? A DRM architecture probably have you know up to you know zero to eight banks. You can have so many um, so many ranks and uh, you know banks per rank and different channels and so on and so forth. But just to be simple, DRM has only one bank. Green means I'm getting data there, um, and this is going to be 100 percent efficiency, right? Every every single cycle. I'm getting data from a, from a particular transaction, right? This is perfect. This is ideal. Um, this will never happen. But <laughs> um, it's okay, though. This is the example. So efficiency is this data cycles over dead cycles plus data cycles, right? Um, note that utilization is different. Utilization is, is counting the idle cycles, 
right? And but efficiency is saying um, for the time that there are transactions in the system, how good am I at, at, at processing them and um, utilizing that available cycles? Um, okay, so efficiency factors, right? A lot of it goes into the DRAM spec. There's got, there's all these circuit level things that are imposed upon us. I say that because I'm not in a circuit group. That are imposed upon us that say we have to operate in a certain way. Um, the traffic pattern is probably the key thing, right? Um, so in this case, I'm assuming um, I'm getting all hits on the, on, in, the, in the open page in the DRAM bank. But if, if you're getting hits, for lack of a better term, that's good. <laughs> if you're getting conflicts, um, that's bad. Um, conflicts meaning that, um, Let me just start off right here. So I'll get the conflicts in a second, but 100% hit traffic, meaning um, I have these transactions, zero through five. Um, in a particular DRAM, DRAM bank, I have um, zero to n amount to n rows, right? It's a hit if I can have a transaction that's already going to an open row, right? So the, all those are hits. That's my best case scenario. Um, like I said, it'll never happen because you're going to do more than what's going on on a particular page, DRAM page, but those are all hits. A conflict is if I would have row one here and row two on the next one, right? So it's a conflict because row one is open, but my next transaction, row two, is not on the open row. So I'm going to have to close row one and go get row two. So that's a conflict that's going to cost me overhead cycles. That's going to cause inefficiency, right? Um, so this is the best case scenario, of course. The worst case scenario, right? Um, worst case scenario being uh, every transaction to a particular bank is a conflict. It's, all, it's going to a different row. Um, and in that case, um, I get transaction zero, then I have some dead cycles. I get transaction two, dead cycles. Dead cycles being the cycles that it takes to um, resolve that conflict, if you want to get really specific, um, the row cycle time of the DRAM page. Um, so we, if you want an efficient uh, memory controller, we need a good traffic pattern. Um, and, well, and if you're not going to get an ideal traffic pattern, we have to figure out a way to resolve these conflicts and um, do better with efficiency so that we get as much bandwidth as we can in our system, right? So that's always going to be um, one of the key problems there. Um, OK, so easy example. More complex example would be um, assume I have up to eight banks, right? Um, I have a hit in this bank, but then I have a conflict in this one and a hit in this bank and a maybe a conflict in another one, so on and so forth, right? Um, I won't go through the detailed timing here because that's probably not so interesting to you at this point. But um, I will say that, that one of the things that you can do is you can utilize multiple banks to high latency, right? So while I'm serving um, a hit on one bank, I can be at the same time resolving a conflict for another bank, right? So if I get enough bank parallelism, I can high latency um, and I can have a higher efficiency, right? So it's the same thing for CPUs, right? You're, you have instruction level parallelism. Same thing for caches. You have some different memory level parallelism there, right? So common, common thread in architecture, you have latency. How can I hide it? Probably with some parallelism to the to the same to uh, probably some parallelism in your system, and depending on your terminology, it'll be banks or uh, your order buffer stuff or, or whatever, right? Um, so one thing that I can use more banks, but there's some challenges there, right? Um, there's there's penalties for switching between region writes. Okay, so if I have 20 reads in a row, that's really good. If I have two reads and two writes and two reads and two writes, there's a penalty every time I switch. Um, and, as, and actually, as you go up in frequency, that, penal, that, penalty, um, that penalty rises, right? So for instance, um, I think nowadays, if you're going to do a 1.6 gigahertz DDR, um, it's actually going to take you, it's going to cost you 50 cycles um, to go from write to read, right? Um, so I know that doesn't really matter that much in terms of scale, because you, you have to know, you know, um, what, what the scale of the system is and, and um, how that plays out, because DDR is dual data rate. But just, just so you know, um, if I were to go down to 400 megahertz, you know, that's, that might be 20 cycles, right? So it matters if, I, if I'm operating at a lower frequency or higher frequency, that reach write switch penalty is going to change on me. It's not linear either, right? So it's not just a, a, a quick, hey, I'll have my Excel spreadsheet and have all, all the nice timing parameters, right? Um, this is where you have to go talk to, talk to the circuit guys or girls, right, um, and say, what do we do here? What's happening here? And, and, and you have to do a lot of trade-off there. Um, also, like I said, you, you can submit to multiple, multiple banks at once. Um, you, can hide, you can hide latency there. Um, also, I said about the rewrite traffic pattern. I think, I think I didn't mention, which is important, but like I said, um, there's all kind of QoS and latency and little, little law type of studies is 
deadlines and priorities, right? So, so this is all awesome when everybody has this, the same priority level. But like I said, if you're on a phone call and modem has priority now, then I kind of have to say um, to heck with efficiency. No matter what, modem has to get its stuff back the fastest so you don't mess up your phone call, right? So that disrupts me because I'm not going to get the best efficiency for my system, but I'm going to get a better latency and quality of service for your phone call, right? Um, it's kind of a trade-off because um, when we do the system analysis, they'll say, hey, why don't you have you know 80% efficiency? I'm going to say, hey, well, you've been running modem for 40% of the time. What do you want me to do, right? So it's going to be always a trade-off between that. Can modem give me traffic in a certain sub subset of banks so that on the other banks I can use something else? Um, so there's, there's all kind of... Um, kind of cool problems, I think, in having different clients that want different things and us managing them with priorities and deadlines, but, uh, but us, us also trying to use different banks to make that happen, right? So I think that's really cool. That's kind of like the main crux of what we do um, every day is just talking and saying, what's your traffic pattern? How do we get it better? Um, or, you know, should we change it on our side or your side? Hopefully your side, but maybe our side, right? Um, and, okay, so memory control has to be smart about these different scenarios, and that, that's, that's the process there. Okay, so we're almost done. I had to add this slide, um, or I think I was gonna get yelled at. Um, <laughs> power matters too. Even though I don't get to work on power um, every day as much as I want to, I have to say it matters. Um, so, power, energy over time. Um, so, if you're on a different technology node, you typically have lower power, right? So, um, I don't know I don't know how much we're pushing Moore's Law and stuff now, even in school now, because it's kind of ending, but, um, if you're at, so if I have a 40 nanometer chip, that's probably going to be higher power than a 20 nanometer, 20 nanometer chip. I, I would say typically here because um, in architecture, I think the answer is always depends. So I'm going to say typically. Um, frequency, if you're operating at a higher frequency, that's typically going to be higher power, right? Um, and of course, design complexity. If you have more caches, if you have more buffers, that's typically going to be higher power, right? So just a quick example I pulled from an Antect uh, this morning, <laughs> right, is... Um, this is one of the things that people look at when they're judging where the phone's the best, right? You can go to Enantech, you can go to CNET, for review, wherever you want to go. Somebody's going to look at what's your battery life. Um, battery life is probably, um, you know, it's more, of, it's, 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 it's a bigger energy story, but it, it all kind of falls into the power bucket. Um, and as you see here, right, so you have these different phones and they have um, your different battery life. So, um, and also I should say battery life kind of depends on how large your battery is to begin with, so manage that, but somebody's going to put it up on a, on a chart, and as a marketing team or as a engineering team, you're going to have to defend, hey, uh, Galaxy S5 has this much battery life, and hey, what's going on? iPhone has this much battery life. You're going to have to defend that and say why and why are we better, and that's, that's, going, to be a, a, that's going to be a choice for a consumer eventually. They're going to say, I can buy this phone, and I can go out all day and play with my kids and go have fun, and my, my, my phone's still on, versus if I'm way down here, this is kind of like earlier chips. Uh, Nokia Lumia, whatever, whatever, you know, I have a little bit of time here, right? So um, that's always going to be a big thing in terms of how much battery should I put on my um, phone or my tablet or whatever. And um, that battery can have a certain amount of energy that it, that, that it can use, but then hopefully my power is low so it's not using that battery so fast, right? So that's where it all comes into play there. Um, I struggled to get a, a, a power trend slide, and I was, I was, uh, I was, um, Tennis swatted a lot this week saying, we can't show you anything because it might suggest something. So all I can do is give you this. <laughs> Which is just like, there's going to be a power budget for systems. This, this is just a very coarse grain thing, but this is just to make you think that there, I mean, to kind of get you thinking that there is a budget for how you design something, right? You're, you're going to start off with wearables and smartphones. You're only going to have a couple, couple watts, you know, three watts, five watts, depending on what you got, right? Um, as you get the tablets, it's going to get more power that, that you can spend on your system. You can put more resources on your system. Of course, you would think that a laptop potentially has more um, resources than a smartphone, so it can use more power, um, desktop, server, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, this is actually, I actually didn't put the reference here, this is actually just through Google searching and looking at power, um, you know, max powers from like, you know, different Intel cores, AMD cores, whatever, but it will, if, if, you, if you're gonna do that search and if you're gonna do a, a small kind of graph about it, it will look similar to this. Um, obviously, it wouldn't be so linear, but um, it'd be similar to this in that if you're designing a smartphone, you might have to say, I only have five watts for everything, all right? At five watts, and it has to be um, at, at five watts max power. And so no matter what I do, um, at the end of the day, when I, when I have a system architect, you're going to have to figure out how to get all your use cases in within that five watts. 
or else. <laughs> or else the president is mad at you, right? So I always have to say that, even though I'm on the performance analysis team, that um, whenever, whenever we do make up a, a design change or suggest a design change, I, I, I'll say we should double the write buffer size. And the first thing someone's going to say to me is, okay, what's the timing of that? And um, how much power are you going to be wasting now that you've added more stuff to the chip? And it always has to fit, fit into different power budgets. Um, it's kind of like a first level of design constraint. Nowadays, that if you're a great company, um, going forward, you'll, have ma you'll, be, you'll be mastering that. Uh, and if you want to whittle away, you will not master that, basically. Okay, so really quickly. Um, so what's, ne what's next? Next gen architecture questions. This is always a funny one for me because if I knew what was next, I would just go patent it and I'd be a billionaire. So um, whatever. <laughs> but in, in that light, um, what's next? What, 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 what are we going to do in the future? What's interesting? I should say interesting to Qualcomm is probably a better way to say that. What's interesting in the kind of field um, that, are, that are people are looking into today? Um, I always think that innovation is it's usually um, built out of necessity, right? I, I feel like you know everybody's been innovative in their in their life somehow. In terms of you know you're walking around and you say, "No, this is really annoying. I wish I had this," right? Um, and that usually says, and if you know if you're an engineer, you're smart enough, or you have enough drive, you say, "I'm just gonna go make it," right? Um, so that's kind of how how I think these things will play out, not necessarily. The obvious trends, but you know, we shall see. This is this is what we put our money into. Um, so, what are you cases that will spur the next round of innovation? Wearables. Um, I don't know how many times do you say, "I really wish I had this smartwatch," or "I really wish my functionality would be on my arm." You know, if enough people say it, then it'll be a, a, a big trend. If enough people don't say that, then it will go away, right? <laughs> uh, but that's kind of the obvious thing that we're going to do now, and that's the obvious thing that we're pushing. And I don't, I don't know how many people have um, the different um, different wearable technologies, but it's, it's cool, and I think. Eventually, something will catch on. Set top boxes. I really um, like these different automotive examples. Um, I think that's uh, picking up a lot of steam. Um, you have different things where you're going to have your native smartphone um, operating system inside of your dashboard. So, it's, so you know, um, if you have, I don't know, Spotify or Pandora or whatever, I don't have to sit there and kind of do a do, do a kind of a weird um, a weird connection that's different than what's native on my smartphone. It'll all be kind of integrated together. Um, I know there's some stuff, different stuff with Android doing that. Um, I think NVIDIA's doing some chips like that. We're doing some chips like that. Apple's doing like some chips like that. So there's a lot of different agreements if you look into the news with like Mercedes and whoever. They're trying to team up with chip vendors so that they can get a smarter um, automotive technology in there, right? Even though we already know there's all kinds of computer and chip technology already in automotive. So I really think um, there's some innovation there. And I think there's some innovation there because of um, if I'm buying a car, I'm usually okay with spending extra $500,000, $2,000 because I'm going to have that car for, I feel like, you know, hopefully five, 10 years, right? So you're, gonna say, so you're, you're less kind of cost conscious on that realm. So I feel like you can add crazy stuff in your car. Versus I think if, if, you have, if you're on a phone and if you tell me it's going to cost an extra 10 bucks, I'm going to say, wait a second, 10 bucks. And if you're going to say it's going to cost an extra 100 bucks, I'm going to say, whoa, 100 bucks. Wait a second, this better be good. This fingerprint sensor better be good. This whatever pay device, this NFC better be really good for me to spend that 100 because when I was in school, hundred dollars meant like 200 tacos from Jack in the Box, right? So, like, so that matters to me. You know, those are people, that's consumers of, of that type of stuff. So that scale, that's why I like automotive because you can, you can I, I can imagine some, somebody paying a lot for that, right? And you're not gonna, you're not gonna think, you're gonna say, ah, whatever, I've already spent 20,000, just add another one or whatever. So anyway, um, Internet of Everything, um, I think that's a big buzzword there. Um, I'm not so convinced on what the right application is. That I, I think it's cool. I think I think some of the, some of the cool stuff I've seen is um, we have a smart cities thing where they're turning different um, what what used to be phone booths in the city, um, like New York City or whatever, they're turning those into like charging stations, wireless charging stations, or wireless ports. Um, I think you I think uh, what is it Waze or I think there, there there's a different apps where um, it's using everybody using the app to kind of navigate around the city, right? Um, so I think Internet of Everything will growing. I think we haven't hit the killer application yet. Usually, usually with these things, people are saying, what are the killer applications? Kind of what I said, like, what's the use for you that says, you know what, I really would want this in my life because I'm annoyed to do it another way, or this is really useful to me. Um, and that becomes a killer application. And then usually with architecture, we're saying, let's design for that application, right? So smartphone became big. We're putting all the computer power in there because people want to use their phone. Will it be Internet of Everything? Um, we shall see. If I knew the answer, like I said, I would patent it, um, and I'd be rich, but I'm not. <laughs> um, and then, okay, 
given that, if you figure out what the application is, then you're going to say, um, how do we improve the system on a chip to do that? All right? Um, I'm not going to be able to put a server in my car. Probably not. Maybe, but probably not. Um, so system on a chip technology, um, technology, higher frequency, we don't have more power. Do you have enough cooling for that? Um, can we handle that? Greater efficiency, right? Can we be smart about that? Quality of service, who, um, who needs what the fastest or who needs a amount of bandwidth? And then just flexibility and power, right? I didn't talk about um, voltage scaling, you know, frequency scaling type of thing. Um, but if we do know that a higher power be higher frequency, why don't we just change the frequency down to low if you we, if we need it at a lower frequency and run it at a low frequency for, say, I don't know, playing Tetris. And then run it at a high frequency for, I don't know, playing, um, I don't know what's, what's, what's nice and cool today, but um, um, what is it? Uh, for, 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 for playing a, a what, counter strike on my phone maybe, right? So maybe, so, so maybe we do that for, that's a high frequency task and maybe Tetris is a low frequency task, right? So um, what's really cool is on your mobile device, you need to figure out what needs enough bandwidth and what is the right power domain. And if you can run something with, at a lower frequency, that's like the golden goose type of thing, right? So, um, all right, so within future architectures, that, that's what we'll think about going forward. That's what I would impose on you to think about what's cool to you, what, what's, what's innovative to you, how does that fit into the profile of modern SLCs, and um, who knows, I might you know, see somebody on <coughs> IEEE magazine or, or, or something crazy nowadays, and I'll say, I talk to that person um, and maybe inspire them a little bit. Can you can you send me a million dollars? But I don't know. I don't know. But if you know if that happened, then you just send me a million. It would be good. All right. Um, all right. So with that, I'm done with the talk. Thank you for having me here today. You know. Yes. Oh, actually, what am I doing? I'm not done with the talk. I am done with the talk. But okay. Those are conclusions. You got that already. <laughs> Next up. All right, now questions. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Do, does your group need to be concerned about reliability uh, of the chip, or is it, is it usually other components on the, uh, in the device that fail? Um, well, I guess when you're talking about re reliability, some of that you're talking about chip yield type of stuff, right? Or are you talking about reliability in terms of... Um, well, I guess, like, like how do you abstract I, that? I bought a tablet um, uh, okay. a couple of years ago, and it was a DOA. Okay. Oh, okay. So there's, okay, so our team so is more of an architecture and analysis team. So that means we're assuming reliability, but then there's a separate team, um, I, think, I think we call it the PD team, product delivery team, that needs to go through that, go through that process of um, we're putting it on some kind of a prototype system. It's going through that, and also, also we'll get the chip back and they'll go through that process as well. So um, there's separate experts for that type, but not, not our particular team. We're, we're assuming, crossing our fingers for some reliability. So now sometimes that team will find something, and they'll send us an EC or a RAT and say, here's some error correction, um, or here's a correction that we need on this chip. How do we do it? Um, usually, if there's a, if there's a, a EC, um, that's very bad. Because we have to, you know, we spun out a bunch of chips that have an error in it, and we paid for those, and those, you know, it's already done. Um, usually somebody's going to be in trouble, <laughs> trouble if that happens. So there's, there's, there's a high amount of, I mean, there's reliability and just functionality, right? Um, so there's a lot of verification and validation on that end. And there's reliability in fabrication, and that's a kind of a different story, right? Yes? So I had a question about, like, the hits and misses. Sure. What, what's the average case, and what, like, what efficiency hit rate are you looking for before you scrap the whole thing? Um... Okay, so it's architecture, so I always say depends, <laughs> right? Um, so it depends on, okay, so hit rate is probably the, the, the kind of very high level stat that you want there, right? You're really talking about hit rate and how many banks am I using, right? I can show you a chart. It'll say if you give me 50% hit rate and if you give me four banks, I can still max you out, right? So hit rate's one, and then... Let's say, so, so, so that's kind of why it depends, right? So if, if uh, so, so what happens is say graphics knows our, our bank bits and our address. And then so they know how to give us a certain hit rate for their traffic, and then we can provide that, um, that to them. Um, just, just in general, um, in your worst case scenario, 100% conflicts, you're not getting any hits. But, even, but you can still have a 100% conflict system 
and still get max bandwidth. If that makes sense. Because you can give it more banks, and um, I didn't talk about you can give it a longer transaction size. If, if, I, if I give you, say, 512, 512 bytes, I can maybe process that for 30 cycles. It will take me 30 cycles to resolve a conflict somewhere else. Right? So it's a function of hit rate, banks, and transaction size. And then I could, then, then I could tell you what, what was good or not. That's OK? Yeah. OK. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're, we're always limited by our max bandwidth. That, so th th there's always going to be the bottleneck between uh, the memory. So the, the memory controller to memory, that's always going to be, that, that's one bottleneck, right? Um, I'll be operating at 1,000 thousand megahertz or 1 gigahertz um, at some, some bit rate. So that's going to be a limiter, right? And then there's a limiter for each component that going, that's going into the memory controller as well, right? So even though I'm operating at 1,000 um, megahertz, CPU might be operating at 3 gigahertz. GPU might be operating at 500, right? So they have their own bottlenecks and constraints, right? So that, so that memory system, um, that, that bandwidth needs to be enough, kind of what we talked about total bandwidth, that needs to be able to enough to kind of subsume all of it. And then I do agree with you in that, um, I, th I think when you say I.O., for me, for me I.O. means coming to me, to mem main memory, right? So yes, I am limited there. In how much you are asking for, at, at one time for any for any system, I will be limited. Yes. Um. Okay. Well. I know, I know about these challenges, because but I'm not in a CPU group, but I know about these challenges because I, I, I bother them a lot about this one. Um, I will say um, one of the challenges that's not, um, it's not internal is that what, tip, what, what happened there was, I think Apple came out with a 64-bit core, right? And if Apple comes out with a 64-bit core, then all the customers, everybody else wants 64-bit. Even though 64-bit may not be the best solution, your marketing says, if you don't have 64-bit, we cannot sell that. Right, so the challenge with that one—that was a time to market challenge because we had planned for a regular thing. We were going to 64-bit eventually, but the, the challenge was okay. We need to have a 64-bit within a certain time frame. Who's the best to do that? ARM sells off-the-shelf IPs, so we'll go there. Right, so we take so we take their stuff, um, or we license their stuff. I should say we don't take we license, right? Um, we license their their stuff, but then um, there's a challenge there because even if you have a design. You have to you have to um, you have to synthesize that for performance and power, right? You can synthesize it and optimize performance, power trade-off, and vice versa, right? So I probably won't go into the, the very big details there, but given that backstory, which is I think everybody knows, if you were to look at the story in the news of what happened with the A10 and how that goes forward, then I think you could probably make the conclusion there of we have you have a time to market issue, you have to pick you have to pick a design point. Do you want best power, best performance? You don't have time to customize it. In the past, we had we, we could go glycine the ARM core, and then we say we take that and customize it ourselves for a year, two years, whatever. So we have a best. So we had crate, I think it was called, mm -hmm. and so we could do that. This one, you don't have time to customize this. We have to pick a point. So that was a challenge, um, and I'll probably just say Google A10, and you can get the rest of that story, right? Okay. Yes, sir. So it seems like um, power is a big limiting factor for you guys. Yes, I've been part of that. Yes. All right. Go. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to do like different battery technology times? Like that twice the amount of battery, did you be able to use a lot more power? You said twice the amount of battery? Yeah. Um, really increasing the size because like that's not something that people want, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, there's a metric that's called days of use. It's kind of like battery life type of thing. So battery, how, how I look at it, and I'm probably not the power expert, even though I'm very aware of it, is I would say battery is kind of like the total amount of energy available, right? So yes, I can I can give you twice the battery. Um, you know that's going to cost me more form factor. It's going to have to go somewhere in my device. So I'm going to you know I'm, I'm going to have a really heavy phone, right? And you might say this phone is terrible. It's so heavy, right? Um, people say stuff like that, right? Um, so you're going to you're going to pay in that, and um, I'm sure there's some kind of uh, 
circuit issues with a larger battery and drawing from that battery. I'm sure, I'm sure you have some stuff going on with it. I would reference my circuit people for guys and girls. And then um, I think even so, so, so yes, if, if I, if I want to have a certain days of use battery life and I know my power, I can increase the amount of battery I have there. Um, but that also for, for power, you have to think about it in two ways though. Power is you know, how much energy I'm using, but there's a max power where, where there's, some, there's some dissipation there. Right. And so, even though I've increased my battery, if it's going to be really, really hot, I might break the constraint there. And if it's going to be high battery usage, it's still going to drain so fast that when somebody says, um, you know, I, I might go from 100 percent to 50 percent, and now I double the battery, I might go 100 percent, 75 percent. You're still going to see that drainage. It's still going to be a longer recharge, right? And, there, and there's battery technology in terms of um, recharging and, and draining and recharging stuff like that. So I would say to you, yes, I can give you more battery, but you still need to fix the power. <laughs> Um, or you're going to be um, in probably big, big trouble there. Okay. Right. Um, and then so, okay, so I have a couple seconds. Since I'm mad at myself, so I knew that I didn't do the slide before you leave today. Um, okay, Qualcomm is a leader. You need to know this. Um, it's smartphone, tablets, the internet of everything. Um, a system on a chip is a collection of all the cores <laughs> on one chip, right? Um, so all kind of stuff that you use every day. If you, uh, if you didn't know, I think at one point we had, um, Qualcomm had like 90% penetration in like Android devices. So if you have an Android, you probably have a, um, a Qualcomm part. If, if you have an iPhone, you probably have the Qualcomm modem part because we, I think we take, we take royalties off of 3G and 4G. So no matter what, you're going to pay us, right? Um, which, is, which is a big thing with licensing, right? If you have good technology, you patent it, you know, you're good, right? Um, and the memory controller is very important because everybody comes back to the memory controller, right? Uh, the memory controller has to, has to handle different priorities between bandwidth and latency. And of course, I'm glad that I've imparted this. Power and area matter just as much as performance. I'm on the performance team, but that doesn't mean I get to, get to forget about power. And new use cases spur the innovation, right? What's cool to you? What do you think you should do every day? I had an idea where I was saying, on my smartphone, I should be able to pro project my thing. because I, I hate to bring my computer everywhere. Um, too bad somebody already did that. But still, um, that's the kind of thing you'll say, what's cool to you? What's your use case? That makes the innovation. That'll go for it later. Okay. And so that's my summary. Thanks.